This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and I'd like to welcome the new ACLU of Florida Executive Director Bacardi Jackson to our show. And we also have Howard Simon, who's the interim director of the ACLU of Florida. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate you coming on. So maybe um, the two of you, I'll ask about the what what the ACLU has been doing and what it will do in the future. So maybe which one of you would like to answer what is the ACLU of Florida? Well, what is the ACLU of Florida? The ACLU of Florida is the state affiliate of a more than now 100-year-old uh, national human rights organization where the nation's leading nonpartisan defender of constitutional rights for everybody, regardless of their political point of view. Um, uh, we try as best as we can to... Um, fight back against government intrusion upon the fundamental freedoms that people have. That means the right to uh, speak, to read, to have opinions or express those opinions, uh, freedom of religion, uh, equal protection of the laws, and so on. So that we've been doing this for more than uh, more than 100 years as a national organization, about 60 years now as a state organization. Um, and we're heavily involved in issues like trying to keep government out of uh, state government, out of uh, people's private medical decisions, which is on the ballot here in November. Um, and we're also trying to protect people's right to read books that they want to read, the right of teachers to to uh, have discussions with their students uh, in classrooms and high schools and in university levels and, and so on. So um, that's my short description. Let me turn it over to our new director to add to that. The only thing I will add is that we are also the people of Florida. We are about 40 staff members. We are over 100,000 members across the state. We are supporters financially. Um, we are volunteers. We are um, just a, a, an amalgam of, uh, of, of Florida uh, that cares about freedom. Marty, how long have you been with the ACLU of Florida? I'm about <laughs> 90 days in. That's great. And how have you been there a long time? Well, I and this is kind of a coincidence that we are both here together, but this is my pleasure. Yes, I've been the uh, state director for about 23 years. Um, before that, I was the director in the state of Michigan for about 23 years as, as well. So I've spent uh, you know, 45 years or so as a uh, state director of the ACLU, and it was about time for me to uh, to retire. And it is my absolute thrill and pleasure to be here and introduce you and, and your listeners to our new incoming uh, executive director who is just going to be a wonderful leader for civil rights and civil liberties in Florida, Bacardi Jackson. And Howard is a bit modest. So let me just add a little <laughs> bit to that, that, you know, it's not just about his longevity of, of over 40 years with the organization, but he has been um, an, an, an impactor. He has affected not only what has happened in this state, in the state of Michigan, but with the whole national organization. He has been a visionary in terms of what the organization can be how we exist and work together across all 53 affiliates and with the national organization. And he has, has just been the visionary who has made sure we have been at the vanguard of protecting rights for, for everybody in this state and, and across the nation. So thank you, Howard, for all your oh, service. Oh, thank you. Very sweet. And the ACLU of Florida is turning 60 next year. Yes. Anything uh, special planned? Well, <laughs> Maybe the most important thing that uh, we've ever been involved in is what's on the ballot in November. My God, this is uh, protecting the right of the women of Florida and the families of uh, to access reproductive health care, including a right to abortion, is so important. I have to say, not merely for the women and the families of the pe people of uh, of Florida. But, you know, all the states around us have absolute bans, and we are it for the, the women and the families of the, basically, the southeast quadrant of the United States. So this is a very, very important uh, 
uh, referendum that's on the ballot in, in November to just keep government out of the medical decisions that women and their families need to make. And there are other amendments on the ballot in Florida. Is the ACLU of Florida taking any position on, say, Amendment 3? Well, we are supportive of Amendment 3. We aren't at the forefront of bringing that amendment, but we know it has been a huge criminal justice issue um, that um, Black Floridians are uh, prosecuted and, and incarcerated at rates four times that of white Floridians for marijuana uh, possession. And um, we, we know it's a racial profile issue. So we are very supportive of the law changing on that front. You know, let me add to that. What we're about is freedom. Um, I mean, you know, we have uh, what's part of what's going on is this crazy battle about language. I mean, our governor has erected signs at the border to the state of Florida saying, welcome to Florida, the uh, the free state of Florida. And here we have, you mentioned, two measures on the ballot. One is the 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 right of uh, of people to use marijuana. Uh, and the second is the right of women to access reproductive health care. If that those two things aren't the definition of part of what freedom is about, but here is our governor opposing both of them in the name of freedom. I mean, this is like, Orwellian. I mean, as if freedom, as if he, he can call night as uh, day is night and up is down and whatnot. I mean, this is a crazy battle about uh, language. I don't know whose freedom he's talking about if he's trying to block the right of people to use marijuana or the right of women to access reproductive health care. You mentioned earlier access to voting. What are the barriers in Florida to for people to get access to being registered or to actually voting? And what is the ACLU of Florida doing to protect those those rights? Well, we know one of the barriers that exist is a, is a, a hard fought um, right for returning citizens to be able to have access to the ballot. Um, it was another referendum um, some years ago, the other amendment for we fought so hard for, and we saw, like we see with many things, the shenanigans of the state to roll that right back after Floridians declared and gave a mandate that this was important to our state, that we believed once people had completed um, their sentences uh, that they should be able to vote. Um, and it should not be a matter of pay to vote. It should not be who has, I mean, we're seeing this with both of the amendments right now is if you have money and you can go to another state or if you have money and you can get a medical card, um, then you have access to rights other people don't have. And so we saw the same thing happening with the criminalization of people who are um, by F Florida voter mandate um, should be allowed to vote. But now the state is putting up another barrier and without even giving due process and without even giving access um, to information about what they owe, but subjecting them to potential criminality, which is has the same chilling effect that many of these repressive laws we are seeing. So we are we are you know still um, very much uh, concerned about making sure people have access that that should be um, given. But also we are focused on redistricting. We have been doing that at a local level and making sure that our districts are drawn fairly. In a free Florida, we would actually see. Um, districts that represent the people who live in those districts. Yeah, I just want to add a, just a little bit to that. We've been involved. I mean, voting rights has been close to the top of our priority for, oh God, for decades. And we've been involved in many, many lawsuits involving efforts on the part of the legislature primarily to cut back on, to make it more difficult for people to vote. I, there are obviously some people in the legislature who think that they have a partisan advantage if fewer people vote. So, for example, there have been cutbacks on uh, on vote by mail or access to mail uh, mail drop boxes. Uh, the, 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 the vote by mail restrictions have actually, by the legislature, actually been pretty effective. It's cut in half the number of people who have signed up for vote by mail. But I want to go back to what Bacardi said a minute ago. I, for me, the major injustice in Florida which is just an overriding, horrible injustice in the state, 
uh, the continuing restrictions on former felons who have served their sentence and their inability to vote. So where we have now, as McCarty said, is a pay-to-vote system. People can vote if they can pay whatever they may owe in terms of fees and fines. So people have an obligation to pay, but the state has no obligation to tell them if they owe anything or if or how much. And that just leaves people in limbo, up in the air, and it's what you what people have seen in terms of these arrests uh, by some people who believe that fairly that they have the right to vote. Well, they, they even have received voter registration cards from their county supervisor of elections, and then they get arrested by DeSantis's election police. So we're, we all left with, a, I think, a horrible injustice by the legislature and the courts, which is that people have a right, have an obligation to pay, but the state has no obligation to tell them if they owe anything. And, and we're gearing up for this election, too, to ensure we have voter protection. Um, we want to make sure, you know, in a in a climate like this one, we don't see intimidation of voters. We don't see outbreaks of violence. So we will be on the ground. And um, as we are in every election, making sure that we have access to the ballot. And one of the effects of people seeing videos of those arrests, people who had registered to vote, but then got arrested after they voted, is they might think, well, it's not even worth it for me to register. I Who knows if the state does or doesn't consider me to be someone who should vote. Right. I'm just not going to bother. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's an even even if this doesn't happen to uh, if even if they don't get arrested or something, they, just the fact of them not registering to vote it has the same effect. Well, I, I don't think <laughs> I don't think we're being overly cynical to say that that's the whole point. The whole point is to it, the whole point of it is to reduce the size of the electorate by intimidating people from voting because there is I mean, this is so anti-democratic that there may be people in the legislature and maybe the governor himself who thinks that there is a partisan advantage by reducing the size of the electorate and in, and uh, trying to intimidate people from voting. That's Howard Simon, the longtime executive director of the ACLU of Florida. And we also have Bacardi Jackson, the new executive director of the ACLU of Florida. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And we're talking about the ACLU and protecting rights in the state of Florida. Earlier, Bacardi, you mentioned the um, redistricting. And there's a the, there was redistricting in Florida after the 2020 census. In 2022, the Florida legislature had a map. It passed a map. But then the governor came back and said, wait a second, let's I'm going to redraw this map. And then the, re, the uh, legislature went along with it. What was the effect of that new map that got passed and is now the law in Florida? What did that do to the districts, especially I'm thinking of congressional districts up in North Florida? Yeah, in the Jacksonville area. I mean, what the governor did, well, let's, let's back up. Let's back up. Thousands of people in Florida were involved in the effort to try to end partisan gerrymandering once and for all by people who remember this is God, it's now almost uh 14 15 years ago in the 2010 election uh we worked so hard to get past the what was called the fair districts amendments and the point of the fair districts amendments was to try to impose constitutional standards on the legislature to end once and for all partisan manipulation of uh, district lines and one of the requirements there was a prohibition on uh, reducing the political power of racial and ethnic minorities. So as a result of the fair district lines, there was a, uh, a district in the Jacksonville area that was, um, uh, you know, that was, was a congressional seat that was uh, in which there was a black member of Congress. And, the, our governor has this view. The legislature passed it, uh, approved it, and the governor came in at the last minute and said, "Wait a minute, uh, we we can't do we can't do that. Uh, force the legislature to redraw the lines, divide up uh, the the black community in a number of different districts, so that black seat in Congress was dissolved." 
And uh, now it's before the Florida Supreme Court, which I think is, you know, in in the short run, it's a test of whether or not the black community in the Jacksonville area will have a political voice or their political voice will be diminished. But in the long run, I think what it really all is all about is the governor's assault on the fair district constitutional amendments and whether we'll end up with just having nice words in our constitution, but uh, a governor and the governor's control of the courts that will leave those words as having no practical impact. In the congressional redistricting is not the only districting case that the ACLU of Florida has been concerned about lately. In July, a federal court resolved a lawsuit that concerned racial gerrymandering in the city of Miami. Uh, that's not all of our audience is going to know about that, but it kind of is a, maybe a microcosm of what's going on with the congressional race. Can either of you describe what happened there and, and uh, what the result was? Well, I'm 90 days in, so I'm going to let <laughs> Howard talk about all of the work that happened under um, his leadership. Well, actually, we, we have a, a, a unit within our legal department that has been doing just wonderful, wonderful uh, work challenging um, uh, racially based gerrymandering. But not only in Miami, Miami was the most visible one because it's because it's the city of Miami and it was a big. Uh, but we've been involved in I don't God, I, I lost track maybe 15 different lawsuits challenging the racial gerrymandering of county commissions or in many, many counties in the, in the state of Florida. And of, and part of that was the city of uh, Miami. And this was uh, essentially the, the Miami redistricting case is very similar to these other ones. It's where we've challenged the district lines that is essentially froze out um, it divided up uh, race, uh, racial communities into a number of different districts so that their political clout was diluted. And uh, we challenged that as uh, in intentional racial discrimination. There was a trial, uh, appeals, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And finally, uh, the, the city recognize the uh, the handwriting on the wall. Well, they recognize the handwriting on the wall after a federal judge ruled against the city numerous times. And I have to say, frankly, uh, with a lot of pride on the on the on on our, both of our parts, that lawsuit I think changed the government of the city of of Miami, which was in which the city council for the city of Miami was drawn in an intentional way. That namely, well, these will be Hispanic districts. This will be a white district. We'll have one black district, and they drew it, and, and they they thought that was perfectly legal, and they can get away with that. And uh, it took a lot of work on the part of uh, wonderful staff attorneys that we have in our legal department to finally bring that to an end. So I think we've permanently changed the government in Miami by uh, essentially allowing uh, racial minority communities uh, to have a greater voice in city government. Moving on to the topic of immigration and laws in Florida and, and barriers maybe in Florida for, for immigrants to uh, participate civically, what are some of the things that the ACLU of Florida are, are paying attention to and are, are working to improve for immigrants in Florida? Well, one challenge we took on was a, a a law that was making it a crime for family members essentially to just drive other family members um, across the state border, whether it's for a purpose of even visiting an immigration office or for some other um, legal and important purpose or for health care reasons. And so we have taken on um, that statute, and I believe we've uh, got an injunction. We've just got the yeah. injunction on that one. So, yeah. um, so we are certainly trying to stop additional um, uh, barriers to families um, being able to just exist in this state. Um, are there some other ones now that you want to speak about? And we're, we, th I think there are two general areas that we, we've been working on. Picardia has just talked about one, which is basically challenge a, a lot of the anti-immigrant restrictions that have come out of the legislature, maybe prompted by the governor. The governor used that frankly, as a, as a platform when he was running for, uh, for higher office. Um, 
And and I have to say that this is something that has is ultimately going to have to be sorted out um, within the governor's office within the business community in Florida. I mean, this is kind of a, a crazy thing that we have. We de depend so much in uh, agricultural industry in Florida, the hospitality industry. So much of the industry and the business of Florida is dependent upon uh, immigrant workers. And the governor's assault on, on that is just totally... Uh, it's it's cruel and it's counterproductive to our economy. But we also, the, the other part of what we're doing is what happens to immigrants when they are picked up and detained. And um, it, we're not ready to talk about it now, but we've been doing, there are th three places in Florida where immigrants are primarily detained, and one of which is in way up in the north, uh, almost at the Georgia border in Baker County. And we we have been studying uh, the really abysmal conditions in which uh, immigrants have been housed, and uh, we we will be releasing a report about that uh, very soon. And I'm I think it's going to be shocking about uh, what we've uncovered. On that note, in June, the Department of Homeland Security's internal oversight mechanisms were a subject of of a. Um, an ACLU report. The report was called Deadly Failures, Preventable Deaths in U.S. Immigration Detention. Um, is this part of that Baker County um, example you were given, or is this or is that separate from this one? Yeah, part of the report we're going to issue in Baker County. Interestingly, part of what we did, I mean, we, we've we been filing complaints, we've been filing lawsuits, and filing um, requests for the Ultimately, for the Department of Homeland Security, it's the federal government. The federal government rents space in county jails to house people, immigrants who are detained. And um, what we've been trying to do is get the federal government to step up to its responsibilities to ensure that there are humane conditions in uh, in these county jails. So one of the complaints we filed was with the Department of Homeland Security and, and the Department of Justice which came in and did a uh, an investigation and confirmed our allegations. So that that will be part of the report we will be issuing shortly. And I want to also talk about education in Florida and some of the barriers that that educators face, whether it's college professors or teachers in in um, public schools. Uh, um, maybe let's begin with the um, with issues in the public schools where people are, for example, teachers are getting in trouble for using their preferred pronouns. What, where did this all come about and what's the ACLU's take on this? Yeah, I think this is probably one of the things as a, as a mother of three, that is, is such a personal battle for me. Um, and one that I think anybody who cares about freedom has to pay attention to because we know that the front line of all of our freedom uh, lies in in our children having the the right to learn and educators having the right to educate and to teach. And we also know that educators are the in the best position to decide what is um, what should be in a curriculum, and it should not be a matter of politics. It should not be a matter of a power grab. And so, you know, what we have seen happening in our schools has been absolutely devastating. I know the last school year we started with about a 7,000 deficit of school teachers, and we have seen teachers leave the profession by the droves um, because of this personal attack on teachers. Teachers don't even feel safe, and I mean physically safe. Um, we have seen teachers who um, can't use their pronouns, who are being restricted from bathroom usage. Um, we are seeing teachers who are afraid to teach subject matters um, and, and truth and basic history. We have seen math books banned. Um, I mean, it is really at an unbelievable level of, of, of feeling like we are in a, a very unfree state. Um, and so, you know, we absolutely are paying attention to um, this whole swath of, of repressive laws that are attacking um, the freedom of people to learn and the freedom of people to teach. 
um, and the freedom to research and the freedom to publish. Uh, we have been at the forefront of the Stop Woke case that focuses on higher education. We just had uh, recently over the summer an argument in front of the 11th Circuit um, and are awaiting a decision from the 11th Circuit. And, and most sad to me as I was sitting in that argument is I live in a state where the state is actually arguing that um, professors are the mouthpiece of the state, that it's the state's right to speech, that it can dictate what its teachers say, it can dictate what its professors research, it can dictate um, you know, what they, they publish. That is a, a dismal state of affairs. I've told my oldest son who is heading to college this fall, he can't go to school in Florida. He is eligible for a full scholarship in, in Florida schools, but I am very, very concerned about um, any child being in this state where our own history is being relegated, where their existence is being relegated. We are seeing student groups being chilled from forming. We are seeing professors who are afraid to sponsor student groups. Um, we have this ban on finances, anything that um, that uh, goes, you know, that supports the unassailable, saleably important principles of diversity equity, inclusion. These are not bad words. These are principles that we should be excited to be in, um, to embrace and to see our students and our, our young people embracing. And so, you know, it is not even just about a matter of the loss of curriculum, but it's also about what kinds of people are we trying to develop in this state? And, you know, when I first moved to Florida, someone sort of lightly said, you know, one of the the greatest exports of Florida is caskets because lots of people come here to retire, but they want to be buried at home. And sadly, I think in my stint here, and I've been here for 18 years, I have seen the transformation that probably one of our greatest exports will be our children. We will see a brain drain. We will see educators leaving and we will see our young people not wanting to be in the state because they will not be getting a first class education or an education that will be um, usable anywhere else in the world. I saw a report in Inside Higher Ed recently where it said that um, because of the new laws in Florida, about 20% of professors, tenured professors who were being reviewed were getting, I don't know if it was denied tenure or or uh, their tenure wasn't renewed somehow. And so the teachers unions are calling it that tenure is gone in Florida, that it's more like a five-year contract. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about about what's happening there? Yeah, that's that's one of the changes that we saw is that um, tenure was removed and we now have this system where um, these professional contracts can only be renewed by a board that's appointed by our governor. And so, you know, preceding this, it's important to put all of this in context and to see the connection of the dots. We also saw our universities surveying as to the political parties of professors I mean, what in the world does that have to do with being a qualified educator on a campus, except that you want to transform our universities into centers of indoctrination, into centers of censorship? And so, you know, absolutely, this is one of those um, many, you know, uh, I think there's, there's been this sort of uh, death of a thousand cuts um, of our academic freedoms. Um, and that is one of them, is that that professors have to please the government, the government appointees in order to continue teaching at universities. Howard, did you have anything to add about that? Well, I, I you know, I, I, I spent about eight, nine years as a college professor before I started working for the ACLU and lucky enough to many decades ago to be able to, you know, live my dream of working for the ACLU. So I, I come out of this maybe uh, I hope this doesn't come across as overly intellectualized, but of but of all of the public policies that we are pushing back against and the, trying to defend freedom from uh, from the, the governor's policies, this is one of the, for me is one of the most troubling things to to essentially abolish academic freedom, to dictate to professors what they can and cannot say, um, and the governor's ban on talking about race. And you can't talk about it in a way that might upset certain people. I mean, for me, the, the, how do you possibly understand or learn about American history without 
understanding the crucial role that race has played in almost every aspect of our history before from before there was a constitution before it was a Declar declaration of independence i mean obviously race is uh, crucial to um uh to the our aspirations about the promise of what this country is supposed to be as laid out in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And to, to have restrictions on that because, because information about it may be upsetting to certain people. I mean, education is supposed to upset you. Uh, it's not supposed to just confirm your prejudices. It's supposed to upset you by learning different things. And this, this assault on the freedom to think, to speak, uh, the, the, the assault on academic freedom, uh, for me, is one of the most troubling aspects of all of DeSantis's policies. Well, we've covered a lot in a half an hour, but if there's <laughs> anything else that uh, we should talk about with our audience before I let you guys go. Yeah, there, there is one thing I want to make sure we hone in on. And right now we have our entire organization is all hands on deck to pay attention to what is happening to the loss of reproductive freedom in this state. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I am a mother, I have a daughter, and it is incredibly disheartening to me that she may exist in a world where she has less freedom than I did. I, I stand on the shoulders of civil rights um, activists who are my parents, and I know it is my responsibility to deliver to my child and my children and everyone's children a more free place, not a less free place. And what is happening right now um, with Amendment 4 on the ballot is that we um, are seeing the government again come in and attempt to um, undermine the great momentum, the will of the people. We know we have well over 60 percent of the people, which now is this unbelievably high threshold that has been imposed on the citizens of this state in order to amend the Constitution. Um, but we know we have over that, but the government is attempting to um, confuse voters. We have been having this fiscal impact statement battle um, that I don't know if a lot of people are aware of, but they should be aware of. And, and the first fiscal impact statement that was written was declared by a court to be unconstitutional. It still referenced a 16-week ban, a 12-week ban, in order to confuse voters. It had no other purpose than that, um, that it was not um, amended as the law changed to uh, what's called a six-week ban, but is in actuality much less than six weeks. Um, and so we saw in the midst of that battle where we had won that case and the state appealed, the state then took the... Um, the opportunity to have three additional convenings of the FEIC, and that's the, the body that um, determines what the fiscal impact statement is. Now, that body usually is just um, looking at, you know, pretty mundane, objective kinds of facts about fiscal impact. It's economists. It, it's people who crunch numbers. And on that body um, is one of the state's greatest economists. Um, but instead of continuing with the body that existed, um, the state, DeSantis and the, the legislature came in and 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 uh, put in two new members to that body. One of them, uh, uh, someone from the Heritage Foundation, and another person who's a political uh, crony, who had a a, a certain um, mission to come in and make sure that that language was as confusing as possible. And so what we see now is this language that is deeply, deeply prejudicial. Um, that is confusing, that is misleading, that follows none of the constitutional principles that the court laid out very clearly for the state that was required for this fiscal impact statement. And so we see a statement now that is, um, you know, not at all based in fact or objectivity or really looking at any kind of financial impact, but it was designed to try to scare people. It is designed to bring up things that are completely speculative nothing at all to do with any of the objective principles that you write impact statements for so people can make a decision fairly and honestly. And so this current impact statement is making references to things like the possibility that there may have to be state-funded abortions. There's absolutely nothing about the amendment that would require that or that would 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 you know go into that direction they are making insinuations about whether or not parents will be involved in children's decisions there is nothing in the amendment about that um, and so these speculative statements are meant to confuse voters and we um, want to make very very clear that we are doing everything we can we are we've been part of a, of an incredible 
powerful coalition called Floridians Protecting Freedom. We are very excited to sit at the table with many organizations who care about this freedom, who care about pregnant people. And we also understand that this battle is critical, not only for Florida, but for the ecosystem of access to abortion. Um, we are, as Howard mentioned earlier, the only state in the Southeast that has a citizen initiated process to amend our constitution. And we are surrounded by states that have total bans. We are it for the Southeast. This opportunity is it for the Southeast. And so it is such a critical battle. We want to invite people to join us in it, to, um, you know, to, to make sure they are paying attention. Um, the language on the ballot is it may be confusing. We are still fighting it. We're up in, you know, we're out in front of the Supreme Court now with a motion hoping to um, get some justice in that regard. Um, but if we don't succeed and that horrific language is on the ballot, we need to educate people. So we need people to share information about what is Amendment 4. The, the actual summary is the first 75 words and everything else after that is state propaganda to undermine it. And Howard, anything as we close? No, no, I don't. I, I, that was eloquently put. Um, I think in this period of time, uh, the ACLU is probably one of the most important organizations in the country, certainly in Florida, where we're fighting back against authoritarian public policies. Um, we, we are so needed right now. And what you just heard from is our new leader, McCarty Jackson, and I hope you, your listeners will get to meet her going forward, and she will be uh, a, a very important, inspirational leader for the the cause of defending true freedom, not not the governor's manipulated understanding of freedom, but real freedom for the people of, of Florida going forward. Well, Howard and McCarty, I thank you very much for coming on Tuesday Cafe. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for the opportunity to speak to your listeners. And we are excited about working alongside them to actually free Florida. Thank you. Thank you.